So it's a real pleasure to have Dr. Sarah Peters Kernan with us this evening. Dr. Kernan is an independent culinary historian with a PhD from the Ohio State University. She's currently working on an exciting monograph um, about the production and use of cookbooks in medieval and early modern England, and also working to create an edition of the 17th century recipe book that she transcribed and researched um, as a food studies fellow at New York Public Library. She's now a scholar in residence at uh, the Newbury Library and is editor of the well-loved The Recipes Project and a corresponding member of the Journal of Food and History. Um, so thank you so much for being here today um, presenting her paper, Creating Cookbooks, Networks of Recipe Readers and Writers in England, 1300 to 1700. Thank you so much. Um, so let me start screen sharing. <laughs> Can uh, and everyone see that all right? Great. Um, so I'd like to begin um, by thanking first all the food history seminar conveners for the opportunity to present today. And thank you also to Eleanor for chairing today's session. And um, also thank you to so many of you um, for taking the time to attend. Uh, I'm, I'm very um, humbled that so many of you have, have come to hear this talk today. So thank you. So I have been researching early English cookbooks for over a decade now, traveling between libraries to explore the lives of books. I have documented excitedly a litany of textual, codicological, and bibliographical features of cookbooks in order to craft a narrative of English cookery production in medieval and early modern Europe, England. The current pandemic, however, has influenced how I am moving forward, forward with my research. This past year, as we have been homebound, many physically separated from our families, friends, and colleagues during this time, we are all thinking a bit more about our relationships and our communities. And for many this past year, food and cooking has become a clear marker of our relationships, keeping our own networks of friends and family together. The foods we remember, the foods that we share, even at a distance, serve not only to remind us of others, as well as the groups to which we belong. In experiencing so much physical distance from friends and family, I've become much more aware that what has been lacking in my research thus far is the human element, the notion that people used culinary recipes to connect to others. Cookbooks and recipes were not somehow divorced from the social component, even ones created and shared many centuries ago. People created recipe collections, bought cookbooks, bound cookbooks together, and marked up their recipes with notes and emendations, in part because it made them a part of a group, a network. Sometimes they knew the people doing exactly what they were with recipes, and sometimes they did not. But all were aware that the foods about which they should know and the recipes which they prepared defined key aspects of their social status, familial status, and more. None of this will seem very surprising to those in the audience who exclusively research early modern manuscript recipe books. The social aspect, this human element, has been the topic of recent scholarship by Elaine Long, Marissa Nicosia, Wendy Wall, and so many others. There is an abundance of evidence of reader networks and, and communities from identifiable individual and family manuscript compilers and documents like wills and handwriting exercises written alongside recipes. These manuscripts explicitly teach us about far more than the culinary recipes within. However, the practice of readers and writers compiling and circulating recipes earlier than the 17th century was certainly in place. Recipe collections were circulated among social peers and households for several centuries prior. There is unfortunately far less evidence tying books to individual people, so it is significantly harder to remember the people and the networks behind the books. But it existed then, as now, with food, recipes, and the cookbooks one could turn to as solid markers of one's status and the communities in which people desired or were expected to live. 
In this seminar, I propose a new framework for considering these early cookbooks and recipes, a framework shaped not only by the food and the structure of recipes, but also the networks of readers who copied, purchased, and used these texts. I will focus particularly on the shift from manuscript to print in the 15th and 16th centuries, when reader networks included professionals like medical practitioners and gentry households. These groups and the overlaps between them and others I am not discussing today reveal much about the changes in cookbooks throughout this period, such as the types of recipes contained within and the presentation of the recipes on the page. Today, I will focus on two groups of cookbook readers in my presentation, 15th century medical professionals and 16th century gentry readers. These two groups are conveniently situated within the period of 1400 to 1550, an active period for communications in general, as we are met with the rise of the printing press in the West. So many developments in cookbook and recipe circulation were happening well before print, creating audiences hungry for culinary texts and recipes. And until now, these changes have been attributed to the form and technology of print. An important part of my framework is the idea that recipe circulation and readership was driven by networks, groups, who through their social ties and the desire to codify relationships and hierarchies through both food and text, drove the creation and circulation of English cookbooks. Due to time constraints, I had to eliminate examination of other groups in my presentation today, but I'm happy to discuss them during the Q&A. I'm stopping short of discussing the proliferation of printed cookbooks intended exclusively for women readers beginning in the late 16th century, as well as the massive turn to manuscript recipe book production in the 17th century. I'm also neglecting an obvious network of cookbook readers and writers prior to the 15th century, that is royal and noble households. During the period about which I'm speaking today, there's little evidence to definitively connect identified recipe readers and writers. So many manuscripts and printed books cannot be traced to a named owner. However, there are other elements I will discuss which tie these recipes and cookbooks together and to distinct social groups. These 15th and 16th century networks are messy and usually anonymous compared to their 17th century counterparts but their textual practices and recipe habits reveal that people were using cookbooks and recipes to codify networks and relationships. So let's first turn to cookbooks owned by 15th century medical professionals. One late medieval English recipe required that heron, a bird served exclusively to the highest nobility, be placed on a spit, larded, roasted, and carved. The heron was to be served with a sauce made from the bird's innards, seasoned with ginger and galangale, and tinted with the bird's blood or darkly toasted bread crust. A bountiful feast might feature this heron served alongside other fantastic birds found in surrounding recipes, swan, peacock, crane, and lark. One would expect to see such an elite recipe in a cookbook for the royal kitchen, considering that the dish would rarely be prepared outside of that space. However, this recipe is found in a copy of Utilis Coquinario in London, British Library, Manuscript Sloan 468, alongside a collection of medical recipes purportedly from Hippocrates, Galen, and others. Another collection of medical recipes in Latin and English, and a poem directed to the man that well of Lechcraft Lair. This manuscript lacks any decoration or ornamentation, it was written in black ink with minimal rubrication. So why would a cookbook containing luxury dishes be located in a utilitarian medical manuscript? During the 15th century, cookeries were being used in many ways. The genre was gradually developing into one that appealed to a variety of readers. And while some people used cookeries as aid memoir or instructional texts, another group collected cookbooks for an entirely different purpose. An emerging group of professionals in late medieval Europe used these cookeries for tools, as tools for social education and ultimately class aspiration. These cookbooks are located in manuscripts created for and owned by medieval professionals. I posit that cookeries contained in professional manuscripts were primarily used as aspirational texts. 
professionals such as medical practitioners could learn about the foods they should aspire to eat as members of a rising social group. While occasional recipes may have been useful in their household kitchens or medical practices, the context of these cookeries points to a very different use. A combination of codicological features and textual contents of the manuscripts indicates that professionals used cookeries for social aspiration and education. This network of readers used the text to familiarize themselves with what had been served to their social superiors, the nobility, as a way to fit in and excel in a new social environment. Recipes were a vehicle for shaping a group's new identity. 15th century English medical practitioners' manuscripts account for the largest body of these texts and are the focus of my attention here. 12 manuscripts housed at the British Library can definitively can be definitively traced to ownership by medical uh, professionals, such as physicians and surgeons. This group of manuscripts constitutes nearly 20% of 15th century English manuscripts containing cookeries. These 12 manuscripts share three major characteristics which indicate that practitioners not only collected and read cookeries, but also used the text for a purpose other than medical practice or cooking instruction. First, the cookeries are contained in manuscripts that share identical textual and uh, similar or identical textual and codicological characteristics. This degree of similarity is important. It suggests that practitioners sought out and used a shared body of texts. These common texts informed the ways in which professionals conducted business and carried out daily activities. Furthermore, many of the codicological similarities indicate that scribes adhered to certain copying conventions while producing manuscripts for medical practitioners. Second, the cookeries lack the amount of marginalia present in other texts found in the same manuscripts. Practitioners consistently left notes in the margins of almost all other texts found with the cookeries. Because the cookeries remained as nearly clean copies and otherwise heavily annotated manuscripts, practitioners must have read and used the cookery texts differently from the other texts in the same volume. And third, many cookery recipes contain ingredients which would be difficult or impossible for non-nobles to obtain rendering the cookeries useless as practical guides for the kitchens of many professional households. This combination of factors creates a compelling case for the late medieval circulation of cookeries as aspirational texts, rather than texts based in kitchen use. So let's begin with the shared codicological characteristics, which indicate that scribes adhere to certain copying conventions while producing manuscripts for medical practitioners. Physicians and surgeons may have circulated their texts within their small social circle. Out of the 12 manuscripts, two were copied in part by their owners who were likely influenced by the texts, mise en page, illustrations, and other features they witnessed in the manuscripts used by their peers. The 12 manuscripts date from the late 14th century through the mid 15th century. Portions of four manuscripts date from the late 14th century. These four early manuscripts share one characteristic. All or, parts were all or parts were composed on parchment rather than paper. The later manuscripts are made mainly of paper. An examination of the paper revealed that three manuscripts contain related watermarks. And while I was unable to discern the watermarks in two manuscripts, three of the paper manuscripts include watermarks of bulls and bulls heads. Harley 1735, Royal 18A6, and Sloan 7 include watermarks of bull's heads, while Sloan 7 also includes a watermark of an entire bull. Harley 1735 has a watermark identified by Haywood, a bull's head with a St. Andrew's cross. Paper used in England with bull watermarks was most often produced in Southern France or Northern, Northern Italy, Italy, especially Piedmont. Several manuscripts, all containing medical writings, were copied on related papers. It is possible that a publisher bought a quantity of paper from the same makers and produced some of the manuscripts in the group of 12 with cookeries in a manner that Linda Voigt's has proposed for another group of English medical manuscripts. All 12 manuscripts are small, portable, and lightweight codices. Their most obvious features, size and mise en page, are also comparable. 
average manuscript measures approximately 130 by 190 millimeters. There are only a couple of outliers. The mise en page is also consistent. All 12 cookeries contain a single writing block. Most of these blocks contain between 21 and 28 lines, some clearly ruled and some composed in freehand. The manuscripts contain a variety of scripts, though a majority of the texts are written in secretary or Anglicana hands. These similarities suggest that the scribes who copied these manuscripts adhere to a set of production conventions imposed either by a publisher or by practitioners requesting texts similar to those of their colleagues. The 12 manuscripts share decorative elements. Textual decoration is limited to red or blue initials and rubrication in most of the manuscripts. Arundel 334 is the outlier, containing minimal gold leaf decoration, including in the cookbook. Several manuscripts also include illustrations, even in the cookery text. One can find animals and cooking tools depicted in two cookeries, as well as astrological diagrams, images for surgery and diagnosis, and anatomical drawings in three other manuscripts. Three manuscripts also contain colored images of urine flasks for urinalysis instruction. These illustrated manuscripts in particular would not be used in the kitchen. Decoration involving gold leaf or colorful inks was too precious for such a potentially destructive setting. The original owners of these 12 manuscripts may have carefully planned the compilation of texts. Several manuscripts, however, appear particularly purposeful. Sloan 7, Sloan 442, and Sloan 468 appear to have been created as, as unified codices rather than pieced together from pre-existing gatherings. In each of these manuscripts, the scripts, mise en page, and decoration are consistent among all texts. Several texts appeared in multiple manuscripts in this group of 12. While some of these repetitions are of a certain type of text, others are the same text, such as a poem, that man, that wall of Leitchcraft Lera, this textual overlap is indicative of a common body of knowledge valued by medical practitioners of the 15th century. Five manuscripts include at least one general herbal on a variety of plants. Three manuscripts include herbals specifically about rosemary. Seven include urinalysis texts with several exhibiting illustrated diagrams. Another six contain bloodletting texts. Four manuscripts contain texts on two important topics wine production and plant grafting, especially of grapes. And two of these texts were well-known tomes on the topic of grafting by Nicholas Ballard and Godfrey's adaptation and translation of a fourth century work by Palladius. These texts are regularly found paired together in manuscripts as these are in Cotton Julius uh, D7 and Sloan 7. The aforementioned poem, beginning that man that wall of Leitchcraft Nera, is paired with a collection of books or excerpts from books by Galen and Hippocrates in three of the 12 manuscripts. This comparison of features and texts tells us that a group of 15th century medical practitioners own similar manuscripts of approximately the same size of similar materials written with the same scripts and containing many of the same decorations, illustrations, and texts. Not only were medical practitioners circulating the same texts and ideas, but were doing so with manuscripts which physically presented that literature in the same way. This level of similarity between texts demonstrates that these texts were being transmitted together within a small professional circle. Certain medical and non-medical topics and texts were considered part of a common body of knowledge among English medical practitioners. This shared corpus, which included medical, agricultural, and culinary knowledge, indicated that certain activities and subjects were cultivated among professionals. Medical manuscripts containing cookeries present evidence of how these texts were used in their marginalia. While cookeries bound independently or in non-professional miscellanies contain abundant marginalia, including emendation to the recipes, cookeries found in manuscripts intended for professionals contain minimal markings. In this regard, the cookery texts stand apart from the surrounding professional texts, which generally include notes, references, and other marginalia. 
This imbalance indicates that cookeries contained in professional manuscripts were not generally used as guides for cooking. Instead, their purpose was to be read and used outside of the kitchen. To show just one example, Harley 2378 contains extensive marginalia, but only outside of its cookeries. The cookeries represented in the rest of the manuscripts consistently contain scant evidence of kitchen use. This is not due to lack of space. The cookery texts fill approximately 45 to 60% of the folios, leaving plenty of blank space for marginal notes. The readers did not fill these margins with additional text. Considering the copious notes in the non culinary margins, the readers would have marked the cookeries with similar commentary or symbols had they used the text in the kitchen. The recipe texts provide the final piece of the puzzle. Professionals could read recipes from certain cookbooks and be able to identify culinary trends, ingredients, and menus that were associated with the noble and royal class. It should not seem unfamiliar to a modern audience. With today's boom in culinary literature, hordes of people purchase cookbooks they never use. And cookbooks from today's finest restaurant kitchens, an easy comparator to medieval royal kitchens, contain notoriously expensive and demanding dishes far beyond the skill of most home cooks. Yet the images, flavors, and processes keep consumers engaged in modern food culture and trends, whether or not they can reproduce restaurant dishes. Shared knowledge of these foodstuffs creates a sense of community among interested readers. Similarly, the non-noble professional audience owning these manuscripts would not necessarily have cooked the recipes. Rather, these cookeries would have familiarized readers with the types of foods appropriate for the social station to which they aspired. Many medieval cookery recipes found in medical manuscripts contain ingredients which were difficult or impossible for non-nobles to acquire. Dishes featuring peacocks, cranes, and herons are contained in a collection known as Utilis Coquinario, found in two of the manuscripts. These birds were wholly out of reach for bourgeois consumers and difficult for all but the highest ranked nobles to obtain. Similarly, three manuscripts contain the form of curry, a cookery uh, originating in King Richard II's kitchen. In this collection, recipes again feature animals such as turbot, lame, a lamprey, porpoise, swan, peacock, crane, and heron. Professionals would not have had access to most of these ingredients for meals within their households. However, if they dined at the court of a royal or noble patient or began to associate with local nobles, then they would have wanted to be familiar with these foods and how they were prepared in order to cultivate the manners and courtesy to properly consume their dinner. In rare instances, the wealthiest physicians and surgeons might earn the substantial assets required to afford ingredients with an otherwise noble status. And if so, they were already familiar with the finest products to seek and the possible preparations that awaited them. Professionals in the 15th century situated between the middle class and the nobility aspired to the higher class. They emulated noble habits when possible. Certain luxury foods were strictly reserved for the nobility. Consumption of su such victuals identified one as a member of that group. Professionals strove to consume such luxury items, though in reality, such consumption could only happen at noble tables. In preparation of such consumption at the homes of noble patients and patrons, medical practitioners read cookeries which described the luxury foodstuffs and their common preparations. This combination of clues suggests that medical professionals use cookeries for the specific purpose of familiarizing themselves with the types of foods appropriate to their aspirations. We know that practitioners own these manuscripts and that these cookeries were circulated with other texts regularly read by practitioners. Yet features such as manuscript decoration and the lack of marginalia in the cookeries indicate that they were not used in the kitchen setting. The recipe ingredients further suggest that few physicians or surgeons could have actually produced the final dishes. Together, this evidence leads to the conclusion that practitioners employed these texts to learn about higher status foods and dishes, even if they could not yet afford them for their own households. While medical professionals assuredly had individual reasons for knowing about the noble food and food culture of their time, 
the inclusion of these texts within and beside other field specific texts and instructional literature points to a role for these cookeries in helping them learn about the banquets that awaited them as they were welcomed into increasingly opulent dining rooms. Like the emerging professional class in 15th century England, the gentry of the following century continued to use manuscript and printed texts to codify and disseminate group knowledge and behavior. This group of readers avidly collected and read household and husbandry texts. Cookbooks and other recipe books were an important component of libraries as these texts served as guides to living in accordance with one's status. Audience of noble and professional readers, which had been growing over the course of two centuries, coalesced into a ready group of consumers by the advent of print. Rather than creating a new audience, the printing press fed an existing hunger for cookeries. At first, print simply increased the quantity of cookbooks available to readers. The printing press did not immediately result in cookeries in the hands of new consumers. Printers did not even attempt to print original cookbooks. Rather, the first printed English recipes had already circulated in manuscript form. The same noble, gentry, and professional readers were the intended audience for the earliest print cookeries in England. Over time, the proliferation of printed cookbooks, particularly more affordable copies, contributed to an expansion of audience that changed the landscape of cookery production until the present day. The first English vernacular cookery printed in 1500 by Richard Penson, as well as its two subsequent editions, was originally circulated in manuscript form. Other than its nature as a printed book, the Book of Cookery is very much a typical medieval cookery. The appearance of the text mirrors many 15th century manuscript cookbooks. The black Gothic typeface is unadorned, nary a decorated capital or border in sight. Clearly differentiating the pr printed text from a manuscript one is the lack of rubrication, which speckles so many handwritten recipes. The quarto book of 64 leaves also mimics the size of its predecessors. The book of cookery not only looks like a late medieval cookery, but reads like one too. The anonymous text begins not with recipes, but with the menus of several 14th and 15th century noble feasts one hosted by Henry IV at a Smithfield joust, the coronation feast of Henry V, a feast of the Earl of Huntington at Calais, a feast held for the King in London by the Earl of Warwick, an installation feast of Bishop Clifford in London and the Archbishop of York in 1465. The author describes several other untitled feasts before discussing dishes appropriate for various seasons. Following this calendar, which also serves as a recipe index, the author finally provides recipes. The 275 recipes reflect dishes similar to late medieval nobles like Bucknod, Lech Lombard, El Eels and Bruet, and Sauced Camelin. Dishes abound for the Lenten fast, and the text is filled with high status birds and fish fit for noble tables. The text begins with a modest inchipit and concludes with Richard Penson's similarly quiet colophon. The inchipit, hearkening to the cookery's medieval roots, bluntly announces the topic and the audience, a book of royal feasts and a cookbook intended for a noble household. Here beginneth a noble book of feasts royal and cookery, a book for a prince's household or any other estates, and the making thereof according as ye shall find more plainly within this book. The colophon similarly concludes the text, but in addition by Penson, plainly states the printer location and date. Here endeth the noble book of the feast royal and the book of cookery for a prince's household or every other estate's household, as you may find in the chapters and in the making according. In the colophon, we are informed of Penson's printing in 1500 in a shop outside of the Temple Bar, a ceremonial gate between the city of London and Westminster. The Book of Cookery now exists as a unique copy in the library at Longleat House. This copy was owned by the Duke of Portland at Bulstrode Park before moving to its new home in the 18th century. It is bound with a fragment of a tract, also printed by Penson in 1500. In this text, Remembrance for the Traduction of the Princess Catherine, 
lists noblemen and women assigned to escort Catherine of Aragon through England upon her arrival from Spain in 1501 for her marriage to Prince Arthur. Only two leaves of the tract are bound with the Book of Cookery. It presents an interesting counterpoint to the cookbook as the list of nobles seems an appropriate way to conclude a book which begins with descriptions of feasts for or hosted by specific nobles in the preceding century. While the cost of the Book of Cookery is unknown, a general range can be estimated. According to wholesale book prices listed in legal proceedings against Penson, half of his books were priced at two shillings, but he also sold books at 20 pence, four shillings, and 10 shillings. Books varied in format, size, and genre, so it's difficult to make a direct comparison to the Book of Cookery, but Penson likely sold it to booksellers and distributors around the modal value of two shillings. Given that two shillings was the equivalent of four days wages for a master craftsman at the time, the Book of Cookery was an expensive book, so some more affordable than manuscript cookeries. I've located a reference to one other copy of the 1500 edition of the Book of Cookery and a list of books in the possession of James Morris. Morris was a gentleman in the service of Lady Margaret Beaufort, uh, supervising her Cambridge foundations. Morris recorded a list of his 23 books in his copy of Cicero's De Senectute. The list has been dated to 1508. At this time, the Book of Cookery was available only in a single edition. Morris's copy was bound in one book with seven other texts spanning a range of noble and gentry genres, which appealed to one refining their manners and intelligence, including courtesy, carving, and late medieval verse. Once printed, the Book of Cookery made a noble manuscript cookery available to more people, but the readership was not distanced from that of 15th century cookbooks. Such a book would appeal to noble households as a tool for planning meals, as well as gentlemen aspiring to be more like their social superiors. Several features led to this conclusion. First, the cookeries and chippet specifically targets these higher status readers rather than reaching out to a broad audience. Neither Pinson nor any other hand involved in the printing changed the incipit to reflect a desire to reach a new audience. Next, Pinson's output targeted a higher status audience, one that encompassed professionals, gentry, and nobles. The tract fragment bound with the extant book of cookery also suggests a gentry or noble reader who wanted information about Catherine of Aragon's travels. Last, the unique extant copy of the book has consistently been housed in the private libraries of noble estates. Although this is a single copy and cannot possibly mirror the lives of all other volumes, it is notable that the book was preserved in an estate library. While a vast majority of the books were destroyed or lost over time, the surviving copy was in at least two family collections passed down through several generations. Two other printers produced later editions of the Book of Cookery in 1510 and the 1530s. While total sales of the editions are unknown, Oxford bookseller John Dorn left a record of his sale of the Book of Cookery in 1520. Dorn recorded that he sold five cookeries that year, each at a price of four pence, the cost of four large loaves of bread. This was an affordable tax, although not cheap. Dorn sold many books between one and three pence, but he also catered to a healthy market for books reaching more expensive heights of over 20 shillings. While he is not very specific regarding titles, instead providing several different spellings for cookery, Dorn notably uh, indicated these cookeries in the vernacular rather than in Latin. And since Dorn indicated Latin language books in Latin in his records, it is safe to assume that the cookeries he sold were English language cookeries. And since only two editions of English cookbooks had been printed as of 1520, Dorn sold copies of either the 1500 or 1510 editions of the book cookery. Two of the five copies were sold with other texts. One was sold with a book, of car uh, book on carving, excuse me, while the other was sold with a volume of a Latin English vocabulary. The shopping habits of Dorn's customers are telling. The people who purchased cookeries were also spending money on a text to aid in learning Latin vocabulary and an instruction manual for carving roasted meats at the table. 
These were not the habits of the average Englishman. These were aspirational gentry behaviors. The Book of Cookery's bibliographic features, text, and readership all suggest the communicative continuity of print. Initially in this new form, the status quo of late medieval cookeries was maintained. The novelty of, the printed, of this printed cookery was the relatively large number of readers it reached compared to the manuscript source. English readers had to wait until 1545 for a brand new cookbook. This anonymous cookery, a proper new book of cookery, was popular enough to warrant seven editions from 1545 to the 1570s by six separate printers. The first edition of a proper new book of cookery was indeed a very different cookbook than Penson's book of cookery. Most noticeably, the book is smaller than its predecessor, an octavo volume containing only 16 leaves. A proper new book contains a relatively new feature advertising it, a title page. The title page was a feature which served to entice and inform readers, an increasingly important role in a quickly expanding market. Flanked by a decorative frame with columns, scroll work, and human figures, the title reveals the book's contents and audience. And rather than touting any royal heritage, the cookery's title instead touts an intended audience for all them that delighteth in cookery. Unlike the readership of the Book of Cookery or earlier manuscript cookbooks, the audience was not restricted to nobles or those aspiring to that class. Anyone who took pleasure at the table could benefit from the book. At the end of the book, a concise colophon reveals the essential printing information. Here we learn that Richard Lant and Richard Banks, two London printers, took the book in 1545 at a press in St. Paul's Churchyard. Additionally, the two had an exclusive privilege to print the text. Although Lant and Banks typically work separately, the printers found enough success in the first edition to run another printing the next year. While the contents of a proper new book of cookery might seem quite similar to the book of cookery at first glance, consisting of a listing of seasonal meats, several menus, and recipes, all are quite different from England's first printed cookery. The listing of seasonal meats reflects both agricultural and liturgical seasons rather than solely the latter. For example, a mallard is good after a frost, so candle moss, so is a teal, and other wild fowl that swimmeth. And a woodcock is best from October to Lent. Notably, the meats listed here were acquirable and affordable to gentry readers with few exceptions. Included in the following menus are lists of possible combinations of dishes for meals rather than menus of actual feasts. And while many of these dishes and meals were beyond the scope of everyday dining, the menus promoted possibilities for gentry diners, not aspirations to another class. A proper new book includes a total of 49 recipes. After the eighth recipe, the remainder of the cookery is designated by a heading, Hereafter followeth a new book of cookery. In a rather dramatic turn from earlier cookbooks, the recipes in this book feature practical and acquirable foodstuffs and preparations fit for everyday dining in a gentry household. Gone are the dishes that filled 15th century cookeries. Now the reader meets recipes for snow, stewed tripe, tarts, and several mutton recipes. A proper new book also departs from its predecessors in its instructions. The recipes contain more details, such as ingredient quantities. For example, in a recipe for clear jelly, the, rest, the reader is instructed to take two calves feet and a shoulder of veal and let it upon the fire in a fair pot with a gallon of water and a gallon of claret wine. A recipe for a cover tart after the French fashion begins, take a pint of cream and the yolks of 10 eggs and beat them all together and put them there to half a dish of sweet butter and sugar. These are far more specific instructions than earlier recipes usually provided. It is possible that people responsible for cooking in lower gentry and yeoman households use these explicit recipes for instruction, as these households did not regularly staff cooks. It is also likely that the increased level of explanation benefited others in gentry households with a cook. Gentlemen and women would have uh, written assistance in planning for entertaining and educated servants. 
like clerks would be better prepared for outfitting the kitchen with necessary foodstuffs. As the numbers of the gentry ballooned in 16th century England, the general education in food found in a proper new book was likely welcomed by gentry and servants alike. While much of this book was new, certain bibliographic features remained unchanged. The book still contains black letter typeface, though the letter forms are thinner than Pimpton's set, and the letters are spaced farther apart, thus rendering the new text easier to read. Additionally, a proper new book contains printed manicules, an organizational feature common in medieval texts. By providing a brand new text in a familiar form, Lance and Banks helped establish legitimacy in a novel book aimed at a fresh audience. Their book certainly piqued the taste of the gentry. Six more editions of a proper new book were printed during the next 30 years. So after centuries of a gradually increasing readership for manuscript and printed cookeries, the audience was large enough to warrant several editions and print runs of a cookbook divorced of overt noble titles, that is, thousands of copies intended for a predominantly gentry audience. The first printed English cookeries are notable for their differing functions. Henson's Book of Cookery was important for the dissemination of a single text of a familiar genre to a greater number of people. Nobles, gentry, and professionals all had all access to cookbooks in the past. Now hundreds of copies of the same text were available to the same audience. While the text is targeted at nobles, just like the source manuscript, gentry and professionals benefited from its availability as they did from the dissemination of noble manuscript cookeries. These readers could access the very recipes to which they aspired and with which they wanted to be associated in greater numbers than ever before. A proper new book, on the other hand, was significant then for its reflection of the gentry and professional audience in the printed text, an audience which had been gradually built but not mirrored in the genre until 1545. Their real culinary identity, or at least one closer to reality, was reflected in this popular and profitable cookbook. So in conclusion, Distinct groups of 15th and 16th century readers yearned for cookbooks that reflected their social identities. Late medieval medical professionals collected cookeries that taught them about the tables they hoped to inhabit. This group of readers circulated culinary recipes in the same way they curated the rest of their medical text collections. 16th century readers were just as eager for cookbooks that mirrored their social aspirations and identities. Printers capitalized on this desire for written recipes, eventually crafting brand new books, which did not simply reflect the aspirations of a gentry readership, but instead the realities of their culinary habits. Individual readers in these networks may or may not have known each other. Without more ownership marks and extant books, it is nearly impossible to know for sure. But what we can assess from the longevity and popularity of these books is the degree to which these communities of readers had some connection to the recipes within and the social identities these cookbooks asserted.